before I get started, I would love to talk about um, this. I would like if you have ideas about how does this fit in your library? Like, is there a way that you could see people coming in to be at an iPad for 20 minutes? Or could you see uh, a set of books sort of set out for young readers, you know, like, young, or, you know, middle, like middle school, high school, that's fiction, you know, like I'm a fan of this Fox, the Jenna Fox series. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this. This is sort of neuroethics set in the future. It's very sort of um, chaste in that you could confidently hand this out to teenagers. Um, I also, I was saying, I was reading the Divergent series. I was trying to turn my brain off and then lo and behold, I had to start thinking about genetics as I made my way through that series. Um, and so I, I'm, I am curious, do any of you, have you had much experience with sort of trying to set up these like, uh, interactive, uh, you know, sort of activities or a series of books that speak to genetics. Have any of you done that? Or are you thinking about doing that? Yes, you are thinking about doing that. Yes. <laughs> 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 thinking about it, okay. Okay, all right. Um, you know, because like I, I had handed out this idea of this sort of step, this like five step video uh, quiz, poll, you know, like I tried to sort of make it bite-sized. Um, and I would love then to hear more about those, those ideas when you think about is this digital, is it physical, is it both? Um, because I am like new to trying to formulate that, what, what that would look like. We had lots of success, I think I was telling one of the groups about, when we spent some time at the Smithsonian this summer like chatting up the general public coming through, taking our map ed quiz. Um, so we, we have some idea of sort of how these things play with the general public, despite there being a sort of selection bias about who would come see Unlocking Life Code at the Smithsonian. Um, but be that as it may, um, it still seemed to, to, to work. I'm gonna talk about Henrietta. Have any, how's, who's read this book? Mostly, uh, half, okay. Um, I'm also going to talk about one of my other favorites, which is The Sports Team by David Epstein. So this book, I love it so much. Um, and in part because what David is talking about throughout this book is genetic complexity, which of all the concepts I want people to understand it is that it is, there is generally not one gene linked to one trait, with very rare exceptions, particularly around complex traits like athletic ability. There are lots of people who are looking for sort of that single gene, the magic, the silver bullet, yes, this is the gene that makes me the way I am, or this is the gene that lets me be a really accomplished high jumper, or whatever it might be. That is really not the case, and you know how, high school genetics is taught right now is often still focusing on sort of Mendelian traits that move sort of beautifully through these pedigrees. For the most part though, that's not how traits actually operate in humans. You know, the, the height, right? People think about height as sort of a fairly, you know, you can see it, um, it runs in families in some ways. There's hundreds of genes involved with height. And you know, I talk about how I'm, so I'm five foot nine. My great grandmother, who I knew, I grew up with her, she died when I was in college, <clears throat> at her full height was honestly like four foot nine. So how did I get 12 inches of height in three generations? Did we all marry tall men? Did we like set about this mission to be like, let's, let's get this going here. Like I don't wanna have to pay for hemming my pants for the rest of my life. <laughs> No, you know, in part my, my, so some of it, yes, is genetic, but you know, my great grandmother had a full-time job in a factory when she was 11, right? I was a very privileged growing up in first world America. I had all the nutrition and protein and fluoride in my water and extra calcium in my Fruit Loops that helped me get to this height. You know, so this, this idea of, not just that genes 
that there's some traits that ge are genetic and some that are environmental. Like that idea is really, as we like learn more and more about biological systems, is starting to fall by the wayside. The idea is that the two really interact with each other in, wa in ways that you can't um, easily sort of pull apart or, or tease apart. Um, height is probably one of them. Anyway, that said, I am a fan of the sports scene, and there's another book that's coming out that I haven't, I like don't have an advanced copy of it, by um, Dr. Eric Topol called The Patient Will See You Now. <laughs> and it is sort of describing this idea that because of technology, that people are becoming much more empowered and informed about their health. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit about some folks who are sort of pioneers in that idea of citizen science, which I know many librarians and libraries are sort of have 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 sort of delved into this a bit. Is that a fair statement? What? Oh, tell me, what kind of citizen <laughs> science things do you do? Well, I, I used to be a consumer health librarian, so um, I've certainly done book discussion groups with clinicians, and I've helped people make informed decisions, uh, their own health, yeah. you know, shared decision making was coming into uh -huh. that was being popular uh -huh. at the time when I was getting ready to go out of class. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, we had a lot of decision guides yep. and we would tell people to understand statistics and plain English. Yep. Uh, yeah, the writer um, Thomas Getz, G-O-E-T-Z, wrote this book called The Decision Tree. That's relatively recent. That is actually a great sort of how, right, how you sort through information to come to a, the path. Um, so, again, we're going to talk about books. We're going to be free of jargon, and you know these are the books I'm going to highlight. Um, in addition to the Henrietta book, you know, like I am a, still a book person. Um, I also really love the podcast on Radio Lab. This is ACEs, this is a sort of thing, headphones, this, se this segment is like really 10 minutes long. So again, going back to this idea of how do you put these pieces together or how do you say, okay, is it, you know, I've got, I've only, you know, I don't have, I maybe can't engage a particular group to read this whole book and have a four week series, you know, maybe that's not your crowd. You know, one of these chapters, I have a few favorite chapters in here, uh, and you know, 10 minutes of Radio Lab can actually get you quite far into the, into the discussion. I think I told everyone about how the Human Genome Project cost $3 billion this year in 2014. Um, we are looking at having sequenced t almost 22,000, 300,000. Uh, about, I, I bet at this point, knowing what has happened, we're probably, this is probably a close number, at about $1,000 a piece. Um, when they did Dr. Watson's in 2006, it cost $5 million to do that for him. Um, some of you might have seen Dr. Watson has been in the news recently, um, <laughs> selling his Nobel Prize in part because he has had experienced sort of a loss of income and stature over <coughs> some of his racist um, and sexist comments over the years. Um, there's this amazing teacher in Oakland, California, who has these rap videos with his kids, and they do this this rap battle, this sort of rap battle about Rosalind Franklin, who was one of the collaborators whose data was sort of used as an essential part of the Watson discovery of the double helix, but never credited. Um, and it is hilarious. It's set to the Kanye West song, Click, except it's Crick. <laughs> <laughs> and it is so funny, it's seventh graders. And she does, and like the, the young woman playing Rosalind Franklin, like brings the house down in this, in this video. Um, Tom McFadden is the teacher who makes these videos. I was talking about, you know, who wants to put their, you know, would you rather have your, e your email hacked or your genome? Um, these are some of the folks that have sort of gone first and have agreed to put their DNA online. Part of what they are trying to do is they are trying to help build a database 
connecting their sort of physical traits. I promised I wasn't going to use jargon, but I'm going to use, you know, their, their phenotype, what they look like, who they are, and their genotype, their genes. And the idea, right, the big picture right now in genetics is to sort of build this bridge between, okay, these people have this trait, and huh, what are the genes that help, you know, get us to that trait? Um, all of these folks um, agreed to put their DNA online in addition to um, their medical history. This in the middle is um, Professor George Church, who is the leader of this project called the Personal Genome Project. Um, some of you might recognize Steve Pinker down here, Steven Pinker, the um, writer and psychologist. Um, I had talked a little bit about uh, a sperm donor who had, um, he was a sperm donor, wanted to help people out, didn't, uh, thought his sample was eventually going to be used for research, and in fact, he has 400 biological children as a result of being a sperm donor and was not, did not consent to that, certainly. Um, <laughs> well, so what he has done, Dr. Maxey has really sort of become this sort of advocate for sort of open uh, access and, and sharing his, his DNA, making it available to all of those biological children of his. But you know, these consent issues that are tackled in Henrietta Lacks, right, which is the very, very short summary of this book, which is uh, <laughs> rural African American woman in the hospital, cells taken. Um, in the course of treatment for her cancer, her cells turned out to be the first cells that they could get to grow outside of the body. They grew in a dish. It's called an immortal cell line. They're called HeLa cells. Many of you, if you ever took college biology, probably worked on them. Um, and, you know, the, and part of what this book tells is the story of her family sort of coming to both awareness that this has happened, that their mothers and aunts and sisters' cells are widely dispersed all over the world in a way that is astonishing. And all of this research and all of this sort of wonderful work has come in the healthcare world from her cells and her family looking at, you know, not having access to healthcare and not understanding sort of what this means in terms of their mother's cells and where are they and how are they being used and do they have rights to them? Is that a good summary for the people who have read this book? <laughs> Is, okay, all right. I could go, you know. Um, so, so anyway, these ideas around consent and, you know, saying, I understand what is going to happen to me in this medical situation I am in. I understand the short term. I understand the long term. Is still a really challenging topic, particularly in genetics, because, again, it is changing so rapidly. I use the example about um, if you sign up for one type of study and then sort of incidentally they find some other genetic information that might be actionable to you. Should you, do you have to ask for it? Should the doctor presume you want it? You know, and, and so these issues are still very much part of everyday sort of medicine. Speaking of immortal cell lines, right? So. Um, when um, Henrietta Lacks had her cells taken, it had, they had never been able to get cells to grow and replicate in a lab before. Now there are organizations that have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cells, different cell lines. Everyone in the Personal Genome Project has agreed to have a cell line made. Um, they make them grow in a little bit of a different way. They infect them with a virus and that makes them grow. Um, and so if I'm a researcher and I say, okay, I would like to study this family with, you know, this type 3 of Alzheimer's disease, oh, there's 170 different cell lines I could get shipped to my lab, right? Like this is sort of modern science, this is nothing new, but the idea that we have sort of gotten to this sort of online database of ordering cell lines from Henrietta is a nice way to sort of remind people that this is not ancient history, that these issues, particularly around, you know, the consent process to have I think it's like a 20-something page document to, um, you know, to be in the Personal Genome Project, you have to take an exam, <laughs> a lengthy exam. Um, because, and, you know, they also, Professor Church, when Harvard was granting him permission to do this study, they said, you need to be patient one. 
you know, like the doctors that like tested vaccines on themselves, they're like, you are welcome to do this, but you will go first. Fair enough. We were talking a little bit about some of these online consumer tests. Some of these companies, and I'm, I'm using this as an example, I don't endorse any company in particular, I have no connection to them in any way, financial or otherwise, except to say, you know, I did use this service, my dad and I used this service. Um, and so this is part of what one of their, how they return results to you, right? So this alcohol flush reaction, there's certain sort of ethnicities that are more likely than others to become very pink cheeked when they drink alcohol. Um, and they're quite confident. You know, Four Star says this is a study that's been replicated. We know we feel like this is a good piece of data. Um, bitter taste, earwax, eye color, brown, hair curl, slightly curlier than average, right? Like in some ways you laugh. We're like, did I, did I need a genetic test to find that out? <laughs> like is this secretly an IQ test? Um, but you know, it's actually, um, you know, so, the, so these are sort of benign in a way. Um, and then we also get into drug response. Probably many of you might be familiar with Coumadin, right? Coumadin is very hard to dose and there are a number of sort of, you know, there's a genetic test now that can help you, help your doctor say, do we start high? Do we start low? Do we start in the middle? So that's the dream. That's the dream. Um, and then, you know, I, I, sometimes I have up my other, my other like health genetic things too. Um, I guess I don't in this one, but you know, you, the idea is that they often will um, indicate, you know, has this been replicated? This was mostly done in Europeans. So they try to help you, give you some tools to say how seriously should I take this or not. They also have dummy <laughs> accounts. Like you can log on as without being a customer and you are either Gregor, Gregor or Lily Mendel. And you can sort of cruise through it and kind of see the types of things they offer. So if you want to go sort of exploring but are not quite ready to dive in. Um, and their education stuff is actually pretty good. 2013, Henrietta, another research team goes to publish the genome sequence, causing a huge uproar. I mean, part of the idea behind this whole book was consent. Um, and in 2013, you know, that they're still as well-intentioned as they might have been, didn't, that the research teams were not necessarily sort of thinking about, you know, publishing their new data about um, the genome and like tying it back to her, her current living relatives. So, anyone know what the NIH did about this? Anyone remember this story? So they, well, so one thing, like HeLa, right, when you're talking about, you know, is this still happening? 55,000 papers published since 2006 using the HeLa genome. This is a very active cell line, right? This is all still happening. This is not, this really is not a historical document. Um, so essentially what the NIH decided to do was grant the Lacks family more involvement in the decisions over their cell line. Great for them, they have been such pioneers, whether they wanted to or not, right? They were, I mean, really very much they did not want to be, of course. Um, and, you know, the, so this is great progress in some ways, but when you think about the issues of scalability, so part of, you know, the scientific world really wants people to participate in research, right? This is how we understand these connections between genes and traits, right? More people, numbers. and. The Non-Discrimination Act law is, you know, hopefully helping people along feeling more co confident. But imagine, like, each, this idea, you know, the Lax family is very unique. But if my sister, my parents, my kids, her kids, we, just, we say we, there's something interesting about us, and we say, yes, you can have our DNA. How much control do we get to have over it? You know, can the NIH replicate this model of, well, you get to we'll check back with you. <laughs> it's not really scalable, right? And so there's all this work being done about sort of how to figure out the path forward around, do you consent in perpetuity? Do you say, if I sign up for this 
study about uh, vision loss, macular degeneration, can you use my sample forever and ever and ever? Is there an expiration date? Well, what if it turns out that macular degeneration is a marker for some other type of dis disease? That that's like, you know, connected people who have macular degeneration also tend to have liver disease, which is not true. But, you know, that idea, you know, this happened with Dr. These, these links keep emerging. You know, when Dr. Watson had his genome sequenced and he shared it public, like, publicly, with the exception of his Alzheimer's status, he said, I would like you to redact that. I'm going to worry about it. I don't want to know. There's nothing to be done, so I don't want to know. So they redacted it. And literally two months later, someone like the science made like a baby step forward. And they had not redacted enough. They realized, oh, there's a variant sort of outside of the gene right here that essentially tells us with great statistical significance whether or not he had the variant that put him at risk or not. So, you know, these efforts to sort of protect privacy, it's such a moving target, and particularly in this, it, with the science changing all the time. Berkeley, Berkeley, Stanford, one of the California schools was offering genetic testing to all their incoming freshmen as like a project. And it turned out that one of the tests around bitter about flushing, alcohol flush, there is a connection between a, that and esophageal cancer. Now, they very much did not intend to get in the business of screening their freshman class for esophageal cancer risk. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so this is, this is like the, the reality of sort of where we're at, that as much as you can sort of learn from this experience about engaging the patient and the family with the informed consent, and, and, and you should, and that is, that is what is happening, it's, it's still a moving target. Um, I was recently at a meeting where they were, some researchers were sharing some data about, they were talking to parents of children who were finding themselves in some sort of genetics pediatric program. So this is, you know, kids who have got a genetic disease and they are trying to sort of figure out, you know, the, the details. Or maybe they don't know if it's genetic and they're trying to get the diagnosis, that, that sort of thing. People who are in the medical system. And they have been trying to sort of ask people to say, well, okay, should we, you know, this idea of incidental findings. Well, we found some other things, or we found some things that we don't totally understand, or, you know, we found what we, you know, some other things we weren't looking for, or we don't know what they mean. Would you like us to tell you? So they're asking, would you like to know about genetic markers that are strongly linked to conditions that benefit from early treatments? or treatments with, you know, there's a good likelihood of success. Who would like to know that about their kid? You could. <laughs> yeah. So that is over in the, re in the data. It's, it's overwhelming. People will say, yes, please tell me. What about adult onset? This is essentially, you know, screening your child for something along, you know, or have, hearing the results around, let's say, BRCA, elevated risk of breast and ovarian or um, something like that where there's a strong treatment. Who would like to hear that about their kids? How many of you think your kids would like you to hear that about them? <laughs> <laughs> at what age does your kid get the vote? Like at what is the right moment in your teenager's life or a teenage person's life that they say, actually, I get a vote? Some say, hmm? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Some will argue it's a, a, that you can start engaging with kids as young as eight or nine, and by f 15, they should be full partners if they're able, right? There's all these other, there's another whole piece around disability, certainly, and, uh, and parents making decisions like that for their kids. Um, kids have a lot to say about this. You want to get your teenagers raring to go in your library. This is, this is like the one. Um, and so this book, I've actually had much success with this with, with young people. It's a very different conversation because of these, these sort of teenage autonomy questions are just really unique to that, that age. Um, and it goes on from there that, you know, less and less people say, I don't want the one, I don't want to test my kid for Alzheimer's risk. Some people will. It could even be half, but it's not everyone. And, you know, you can see the conversation there. Um, 
But you know, I think we owe, we owe the, the Lax family this huge gratitude of, of debt because they, like I said, against their wishes, have sort of pushed this conversation into the, the forefront. Um, and you know, they continue to speak, raise money, they have their own foundation. They have really become activists. They have embraced their, their role um, and travel all over. Like you can find out where they're gonna be. They're, they're amazing. They're amazing and they're not, and it, it's, like I said, in 2013 they were gonna publish the genome. The work is far, from, is far from done. But these, again, these consent questions, if they haven't, w around genetics, you know, they are coming. If they're not upon you yet, they are coming. Um, and you know, there's a study going on right now about are people interested in having their newborn's genome done? Anyone want, can imagine sequencing the genome of their newborn? A lot of people are interested. A lot of people. Although there's, I was just read this the other day that 24% of the parents disagree. <laughs> 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 Which is like just the beginning of the disagreements, I think, when you have a kid, right? This book, so when I talk to kids, this is the book, when I talk about sort of, is athletic ability genetic? Would you like to use genetic testing to find out if you are likely to be injured? You know, I get like the slouchy guys talk to me in the back. You know, like the kids, like not the ones who come up and say, can I have an internship? But the ones <laughs> that are sort of harder to get to um, really respond to this topic of athletics and, and what sort of makes, what sort of, you know, what are the factors there? David has a brilliant TED talk, 15 minutes, 12 minutes, sort of talking in part about, um, you can see the slide, what high jumpers used to look like in the, like how bodies have changed. You know that like the average, the height of basketball players has become massive in the last few years and sort of what is behind that? You know this idea of what a shot putter looked like in the 1920s versus what they look like now. It's amazing that the change. He talks about the big bang of bodies. Um, and it, again, it's that alone could, adv just having a kid listen to that TED talk like brings you along. To bring people in who, um, you know, have, I mean, if you go, the, the theory is if you, if we were to sequence all of our genomes, we would all find something that was considered a disease, right? Or considered a risk for a disease, right? When you go looking for these things, you will tend to find them. Um, and you know, Tim Howard talks a lot about how his Tourette's, which is likely has a genetic component, although it's not entirely well understood, um, is this advantage for him in his athletic career. Um, and so I sort of love to use this topic as a way to sort of like highlight that there's so much genetic variation out there and that what is often considered a disease could in fact, we could sort of move past that thinking in, in, some, in some ways. Um, I mean, certainly it's not, it's not without, Tourette's is not without its challenges. I don't mean to imply that. It's a very actually difficult disease to live with. Um, but Tim Howard, I think, talks about it as it's part of his gift. Also, as we go sort of looking around in terms of genetic variation, it turns out our thinking about sex, XX and XY, that, that there is a lot more variation in that realm than people realize. And in this case, this young woman, um, again, sort of failed a gender test, right? That there's some evidence that she may have either something chromosomally unusual or that she might have um, a type of sort of insensitivity to certain types of hormones, um, and like an androgen insensitivity sort of thing. And um, this is the first case where she's fighting it, where the person is fighting it. There have been a number of these cases, like Castor Samea, the runner, who was so sort of <coughs> publicly mortified. Um, they really did her a, dis a disservice in how they handled her, her case. Um, and that this is the first woman who's saying, this is me. This is how I am, I, this is not a genetic advantage. This is, and David talks a lot about people who sort of have, you know, various sort of like blood diseases, a blood condition that somehow they can ski so fast and so far, and it's in part about the iron, their, their, their iron-rich blood. 
So there's a good amount of science, but it's also like a who's who of amazing runners, athletes. Um, and he tackles race in here head on about these questions about sort of what's with the Kenyan? Why the Kenyan? with the running. You know, he, he really sort of gets right into it. Some of you right remember just recently, 202.57 in the marathon, which nobody thought was possible. Um, and he is, and you know, Kimeto is from that tiny little part, that tiny, that little tiny place in Kenya. Um, and so David really like goes right in there, does not shy away. Is this race? Are they different? What is that about? Are their bodies different? Is there physiologic, you know, is there, what are the physiological differences? Is it environmental? Guess what, it's both, right? That's the idea, of course, is that there are certain physical traits around like um, ankles and calves. They're, they're just, they are, they are sort of, un, you know, atypical. But did they get that way from living at altitude? Is that, you know what I mean? You can't tease it apart. And that's, that's sort of the message in this sports gene book, um, is that they can't, they can't be separate. I'm sure some editor made him call it the sports gene. The whole point is there is no sports gene. Um, we asked this of kids. Do you wish your parents genetically tested you as a child? Who wishes their parents genetically tested them as a kid? <laughs> <laughs> For what? <laughs> For this kind of thing, for tr athletic traits? Sure, I mean, we've got a great gift and we just don't know it. We get to know. Yes, I know. We, we, my dad and I came back that we were unlikely Olympic sprinters. And we were like, well, <laughs> Italian peasants, I don't know. You know, we had to, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but we sort of laughed at this idea of like, well, you know, at least. Darn, but at least, you know. but I mean, I think in part, right, this is like a great exercise to sort of consider these, what do I, how much can I know? How, there, are some, there are some thoughts that, you know, having a, two particular markers related to um, soft tissues maybe puts you at a better, you have a better chance of not blowing out your ACL. That's good news if you are a female college basketball player because that is the number one career ending injury for college female basketball players. If I'm, if I'm getting recruited to play in North Carolina, <laughs> would I be tempted to say to the coach, guess what? <laughs> I have the good stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? You could really see how this could unfold though about, about what you chose to share and how you try and position yourself um, and of course, there was a company that was offering this testing. This is not like from the <laughs> land of make-believe. Um, this is the book that's not out yet, so I can't really recommend it, but I am anxiously anticipating it. I really trust um, him, and I found his writing really interesting. Hugh Reinhoff had a daughter who they couldn't figure, again, another sort of mystery. He like bought a sequencer on eBay sequenced her genome in the, in the garage after work, found it, found her variant, found the thing. Um, and you know, the Barry twins, these two teenagers, wrongly diagnosed all their lives. They thought they had cerebral palsy, they couldn't figure it out. And mom and dad, like crusaders, crusaders. And so there's all this sort of evidence around people sort of using these technologies to really empower themselves. You might have heard of patients like me, the Haywood family, who were sort of started patients like me, Jamie, and uh, you know, about around ALS. Um, the Genetic Alliance, which is this massive organization spearheaded by Sharon Terry, who had twins born with um, an eye condition. And she basically like went back to school and got herself a PhD and found the variant, but like never really got a PhD, I think, at least in that, and like is on the patent, and patented it so she could make it free. Sharon Terry, like there's, I have this idea cooking around like profiles in awesome people <laughs> related to genetics. You know, my husband is always like, works with undergrads, and he's always saying to them, so Mary Claire King, 
who found the BRCA variant is a person who had an idea. And you are a person, and you might have an idea. Um, and so I am, that's another thing I would love to sort of talk to you guys about is this idea, these sort of biographies of these amazing living scientists who have made these advances that are, that are understandable. Like you can go places, you can find, you can talk to Mary Claire King. She might email you back. <laughs> um, and so again, I think this is, I hope this is sort of a start of a conversation um, because I have all these ideas and I, I, they're still kind of broad. Some of them are getting narrowed, um, like I said about this one about genetic discrimination, but I would love to sort of stay in touch and Cindy will, will help us do that hopefully. Um, so I'm gonna be like hanging around, hanging around a little bit so we could talk more hopefully and I'm so easy to find, it's scary. Dana Waring, and you will find me and my email, and my Twitter, and my everything. Yes. So. <laughs> so, so you, can, you can contact me as well, but for some reason you can't find her. <laughs> so thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs>